and Act 8 of the Apostles, Scene 2. And it's a carryover from what we did Wednesday night, um, uh, because there's a lot of information in these verses to come. Some of this, you would like more clarity as how the scene today is being set up. I invite you to watch that. It's on YouTube and it's on the Facebook uh, website for the church. And uh, so you can look at that there and, and maybe help uh, give you a little more continuity to how we get started this morning. So with that being said, let's have a little action. Now, <clears throat> we previously set the stage Wednesday night in Acts chapter 8, and we went from verse 3 up to verse 15. And in this story, we hear that Philip, and it's not the apostle Philip, it's Philip the evangelist, a disciple of Jesus, but not the apostle, was dispersed from Jerusalem down to Samaria. And he was preaching Christ, and he was performing miracles, healing the lame, and removing unclean spirits through the power of Jesus' name. Many, many Samaritans were believing. Then a sorcerer named Simon, who had been doing his magic and his tricks to fool people into thinking Simon was the great power of God. He had been doing this for many years, and people listened intently to his words. This is most likely how he supported himself financially. As Simon listened to Philip and saw the miracles being performed in the name of Jesus, something amazing happened. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. You see, the amazer has now become the amazed. It is important to note that the very first phrase of verse 13, we need to look at carefully. Then Simon himself also believed. Who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, who is described as Peter and John, who were sent to Samaria from Jerusalem by a consensus of the apostles and are said to have prayed for those who have believed of the things that Philip had proclaimed to, you, to them. The apostles' prayer. What did the apostles pray for? What was their prayer? The Holy that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to find out why that's an issue. The apostles here are certainly trying to determine exactly what it means to be a true worshiper of God. Under this new covenant, each step of the process is new to the apostles. Up to this point, things that have occurred detail a story of heading into the unknown. The apostles surely remembered the words of Jesus that were spoken near this same location as a woman came to draw water from the well. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And then Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain, which was in Samaria at that time, nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. They would have also remembered something else that Jesus said. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there may be some confusion with the apostles at this point. Because remember, they have stayed in Jerusalem, and we don't know exactly how long this period has been. Could have been a week or two, could have been months, maybe it was two or three years that they have been winning converts in Jerusalem proper. But they were called to do something more. And yet they stayed in Jerusalem preaching the word and preaching the gospel. And it was Saul, who would later become Paul, who initiated the Sumerian mission trip. And so without Saul's persecution, the people might not have scattered like Jesus had already asked them to. It took Saul's effort to make that happen. They were comfortable in Jerusalem. They were winning souls. Why go out anywhere else? Because they were called to, that's why. For as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. Talking of the Holy Spirit. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. This is the first time the idea of the Holy Spirit would be falling upon someone. It's the first time it's used. And it will be seen again in Acts 10, 44 and chapter 11, verse 15, when referring to the conversion of Cornelius and his family and those that were joining Cornelius at that time. Now, it is remarkable that such a term is used when referring to the Samaritans. And it later refers to the Gentiles in Caesarea. It is as if the Holy Spirit was there anticipating the right moment to respond with the greatest of all affection in welcoming these people into the family of God. What occurred with the Jews in Acts 2 seems like an anticipated event that was the fulfillment of the hope that had been seen in the disciples all along. Now let me rephrase that a moment. Remember, the disciples and the apostles, those people who had been hearing Jesus' word, they knew something was coming. He had promised that to them, right? They knew about it. But the Samaritans? Maybe this one lady at the woman at the well, if she really understood, they had no clue. They didn't know what to expect. And you got to think that when Philip showed up, they're all like, what? Who is this Jesus guy? What are you talking about? Until that first miracle happened. And people stood up and said, ooh, what's going on here? So, but these people, because of their understanding, or their lack of understanding, <clears throat> there's a special word that's Greek that we translate into falling upon. And it's important that we know that it has a fuller meaning more, it's, it's more like a sudden and overwhelming embrace in an unexpected union with God. Even though each instance of the conversions is different that we see in Acts, the same pattern of obedience to the word of the Lord is seen. You give the gospel, when it, was, when it is received and believed, you baptize. That is the pattern. And this is exactly what the Lord stated, and it is exactly what is expected even today. It is important to note these conversions that we see here in Samaria to the ones in Acts 2. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, this is spoken to those in Jerusalem. And they were told what? First to repent. Then to be baptized. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. There we go. To repent. Be baptized. 
And then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts 8, nothing has been said about repentance or changing their minds. Their minds didn't need to be changed. What did the Jewish minds need to be changed from? They had to repent first in Acts 2. Why? What did they rely on? The law. They relied on the law. Now you've got to change your thinking. Repent. You now have a new covenant. You have to change. If you're not thinking about the law and relying on the law to give you everlasting life, do you need to repent? You weren't relying on it to begin with. Okay? So... <clears throat> Now in Acts 8, nothing is said of repentance. Instead, it notes that the people in 8.6, they heeded, they believed in 8.13, and received the word of God in 8.14. After this, they were baptized. That's all that's happened at this point. And this is highlighted by a very important word, only. They had only been baptized. These Samaritans had no idea what to expect, and the apostles know what had happened in Acts chapter 2. They know what had happened to the believing Jews at Pentecost and those afterwards. But these people <laughs> are not considered Jews, and they're not considered Gentiles. Even the Jews would associate with Gentiles. Samaritans? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. We're not associating with you. So, there is a process that is being followed. Each believer who has the hands of the apostles laid upon them now receives the Holy Spirit. So one must ask ourselves, is this going to be normative? Is that what happened in Acts They were sick. There was who you, which apostles had the Holy Spirit were going to lay hands on the ones in chapter 2 because none of them had the Holy Spirit until it lighted on them like flames on their head. Right? So there was no laying on the hands. So now we have something different happening. Could you imagine? We know that Philip and, I mean, John and and Peter are praying for them to hold the Holy Spirit. They're praying about that. They're asking the Lord for that to happen. And maybe they go over to console somebody. You'll get the Holy Spirit. Boom! Peter and, um, Peter and John were probably just as amazed at what happened as the Samaritans. Each believer who has their hands of the apostles laid upon them receives the Holy Spirit. So, is this what's going to happen from now on? Is this the way the Holy Spirit is going to be given? If it is, then it would be required for everyone from Acts 8 on. Further, it would continue to be needed to do in all of the stories of Acts. But in Acts chapter 10, we read this. While Peter was still speaking, and he's speaking here to, um, well, his name just went out, uh, Cornelius. Cornelius, there we go. <clears throat> he's speaking to Cornelius. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. Now, wait a minute. Here Peter is, he's laid hands on people in Samaria to get the Holy Spirit, and now he's just talking. And all of a sudden, the people who are believing in Caesarea are filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no touching going on. Maybe they had COVID, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> for some reason, it's a different process. Now, I'm sure Peter's amazed again. He was probably ready to lay hands. Who believes? I Whoa, I didn't even have to do a thing. Ignoring accounts. Well, first of all, let me back up. I got to say one thing here. 
I remember. All right. So if we think that the laying of the hands on people or that there's going to be a certain way that the Holy Spirit fills you and you have to be dogmatic about this is the way you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, there's a problem. You would have to ignore the accounts where laying on the hands is not even followed. Assuming a person laying hands on another has apostolic authority. How many people in here are apostles? We have the authority, but are we apostles? Okay. We're disciples. Okay. When the authority was given, who was it given to? The apostles. Jesus gave that power to the apostles. We can assume he gave it to us. How many of you have laid hands on somebody and the Holy Spirit came upon them? Okay, it can happen, but does it need to happen in every situation? No, but a lot of people think, in other denominations, think that that's got to happen. That's the only way. This does not match what the prescriptive epistles, even Paul clearly states. And you can find those in his epistles. So, and when Simon saw that through the laying on the hands of the apostles, the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now this tells us something. Something happened visually when the Holy Spirit was given. Something more, something different than Philip's miracles that Simon and others had witnessed. This would have been a necessary confirmation to the apostles that the Samaritans had actually been accepted by God. That's right. If they hadn't seen it, they'd be going... Well, you guys didn't get the Holy Spirit. So, I don't know if you Samaritans are going to be here or not. Yeah, now, we saw that in Acts 2. We don't know exactly how that experience took place here. It's not described. What is important about this passage? Is that the apostles saw it and confirm that even those dreaded Samaritans can believe, be saved, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because who would have thought that? Now it's confirmed. This visual event was as much for the apostles as it was for the new believers. Otherwise, it would later be claimed that God never accepted them at all. Nor does he accept anyone except the Jews, who had an obvious, audible, and visual reception of the Spirit at Pentecost. Now, this is similar to what occurs in Acts 19, when Paul, as he arrives in Ephesus. Now, if you recall, he goes to Ephesus, I think there's 12 men there, and he lays hands on those 12 men, and they receive the Holy Spirit. At the laying of hands by Paul, believers receive the Holy Spirit, and at Ephesus, the specific proofs of the Spirit are noted. Something happens, and we're told what happens, which are speaking in tongues and prophesying. That may be what is occurring with these Samaritans. We don't know for certain. The emphasis is, is that the Holy Spirit was received and revealed. What did the Samaritans do for Simon? Remember? When Simon made his little tricks and his magic, what did they do for him? They paid him. So what's Simon supposed to think? Okay? So he does what? I gotta offer you money. That's the way we've done it here in Samaritan, Samaritan for years. 
So I need to offer you some money. Now he wants what he sees as power. He knows they're not tricks. Or he knows they're not illusion. He knows they could not come from the dark side. He now believes in something greater. And he's thinking, boy, if I can do this, I could probably double or triple my income. The coming verses will show the utter perverse nature of this way of thinking. Now with this in mind, it is something that scholars jump on and immediately start claiming that Simon isn't saved. And his actions have proven this because he makes this request. But I'm going to tell you, that is the exact opposite of what's going on here. Remember verse 8.13, clearly and unambiguously tells us that he believed the gospel. Are you going to say that verse is lying? No. It's believing is what saves. Making stupid errors concerning life in Christ after being saved does not banish us from salvation. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If such were the case, I know I would be out. And according to the testimony of one or two others in here, you would be out as well. Now, I'm not judging. I'm just speculating. I'm just speculating here, okay? <clears throat> so are speaking in tongues and prophesying the only proof today that someone has received the Holy Spirit? My answer is no. People in other religions and in false sects of Christianity also speak in tongues, and claim they are prophesying. As such, those type of things, tongues and prophecy, are not proof of anything. So why are these things given to those in the early church of Acts? Why did they get to experience that? The answer is not so much to confirm to the people that they had been accepted by God, but to confirm the apostles so they could see that they had accepted it. Because if they couldn't witness it, how would they know that the Samaritans had been filled with the Holy Spirit? In the case of Paul's laying on hands, as noted in Acts 19, that was an additional confirmation that not only these people had been accepted, but that it was after belief in Jesus' fulfillment of what John's baptism had only anticipated. Because those ones in Acts 19, they said, how were you baptized? Well, we were just baptized in the name of John, John's name. No, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just the way it happened then. So we have numerous different examples of things going on. But none of those things can happen until you first believe. Before you can believe, you got to hear it. And then after that happens, by obedience, we're asked to be baptized. Does baptism make us saved? But it is a, a commandment from Jesus to do that so that we're demonstrating to others. So they can see, ah, that person has been saved. He has been buried in the likeness of Jesus' death, and he has risen just as Jesus had risen. Repentance from sin, as shown to us under the law, cannot save anyone, at least since the coming of Christ, since he did his work. See, Jews do this all the time, and not one of them who relies on the law is saved unless they come to Christ. Look at it this way. Criminals can abandon their crime and never break another one of man's law and be a perfect citizen. That won't save them. Only faith in Jesus' fulfillment of the law through his death, burial, and resurrection can bring about salvation. So as this is true, and as the reception of the Spirit was proof of the work of Jesus, for the Jews, in Acts 2, 
that Jesus is the Messiah, for the apostles that the Samaritans had been accepted by God. We see that in Acts 8. And for the apostles to know that, wait a minute, us Gentiles can be accepted by God? We see that with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Then such outward signs may no longer need to be needed. It is recorded. Everyone now. It is established. Jews, the half-breed Samaritans, and Gentiles. Who is left on the earth that are human? That covers everybody. We now know that once you believe, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Could you speak in tongues immediately after that? I'm not ruling it out. But it doesn't have to happen. As for the account in Acts 19, it is a clear record for all today that repentance or changing one's mind under the law is not enough to be saved. Those people had changed their mind. They were baptized under the name of John, John the Baptist. It is a clear sign to the Jews, those that attempt to adhere to select laws of Moses or think that you could not be saved unless you speak to a priest in a little booth, that that's the only way that you can repent of your sins. We have a mediator. It is Jesus Christ. And that's who we go to and ask for that repentance because we're going to make mistakes. Let's ask him to forgive us. And is that forgiveness for the benefit of Jesus and God? We have to ask for forgiveness, right? We should ask for forgiveness. Who is it benefiting? You. If you believe, did Jesus need you to repent? No, but you need to make the effort to change your mind of something that you were doing, that you need to stop doing. It is for you to ask for forgiveness. Now, assuming that Simon is not saved because he has been misunderstood the doctrines or the actions of the Spirit, if, if you say that, no, Simon couldn't be saved because look at what he asked. Then it would be senseless to think and assume that another Simon, Simon Peter, the apostle then, is not saved because he failed after he received the Holy Spirit and was baptized. And it's recorded in Galatians 2. And he was just as berated by Paul as Simon will be berated by Peter. But Peter said to him, Peter said to Simon, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Peter acknowledges exactly what Paul will later write about in his epistles. It is apparent a gift is something that cannot be purchased. It doesn't matter how good a bargain it is, if it has a value attached to it, no matter how large or small, it cannot be considered a gift. The giving of the Holy Spirit is specifically called a gift numerous times in the epistles. So let me ask you, who is more damaging and more in a damaging position, let's say, from a theological standpoint? Would it be Simon Peter or Simon the Magician? Simon Peter. Simon Peter, why? Because he denied Jesus with cursing and swearing. Yeah, but what about... He was going right back to the law. He knew better. He had already been teaching it. And then he got influenced by the people around him. He thought, oh, I guess I better do it this way. And then Paul said, stop it. You know better. Simon the magician, he's a baby. He's still on milk. He just asked for what 
is the normative thing going on in Samaria? He doesn't know. Simon the magician had no schooling on the matter, and what he was considering was not something that would keep a person from being saved. Uh -huh. But in that bottom heart, God saw his heart and mm -hmm. said, your heart is not right. You, this is P Peter talking, you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. You, your heart's, you're still thinking that this stuff is worth money. You've got to change. And so he says, change. Yeah. Yeah, but he's not saying, oh, you're not saved. He says, you've got to think differently. On the other hand, what Simon Peter was doing was setting aside the grace of God in Galatians 2. He was falling back on the law in order to please men. Peter remained as saved after his actions as he was the first day he believed. Paul and Peter's interaction, as recorded in the book of Galatians, is a comforting assurance. It should be a comforting assurance that we are saved despite our stupid, stupid actions. Absolutely. See, I don't think he was in that. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun, is there? No, I don't think he was in that at first thinking. No. No, he wasn't saying it. He was, he may, it may not have been that he wanted to make money off. He just wanted to be able to do that same thing. Boy, it may not have been money motivated. But whether it was, but it seemed to be because he said, let me give you money. That is a claim by some denominations and some beliefs, but there is nothing chronologically that associates this Simon with the Simon they're talking about. But those historians try to make it that way because what does it do to you? What does it do to you if you have that way of thinking? Am I saved? Am I safe? And if I need to be, what else do I need to do besides believe? You see? It's the devil. The devil lost at the cross. Now he's got to try some different tactics. When Jesus breathed his last on the cross, Satan was rejoicing. I've won. When he came out of that grave, Satan goes, oh man. What can I do now? And he's been doing it ever since. It started the very day that they came and looked in the tomb. Because what did they tell the Roman soldiers to say? Oh, yeah, the, the believers in Jesus stole his body. Boom! Right out of the bat. we got to dispel this Jesus thing. And it's been happening ever since. But this is what discipleship is for. We believe we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we rely on that Holy Spirit to help us, to point out to us what is wrong. And how do we learn what we're not supposed to do? Read your Bible. That's how he communicates to us. Repent, therefore, 
of this wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Peter's right. It's the attitude of the heart that must be right first. This is why excuse me, Peter first told Simon to repent and change his mind, change your thinking. Only then did he continue with direction, telling him to do what? Pray. Repent and you pray to God. There is no point at all in praying for something until the heart is right and is properly directed concerning what to pray for. We must know the word in order to know what God's will is. Only then do successful prayers be properly directed to him. Simon believed. It does not mean that he suddenly became a person without fault. Rather, in his state, God's grace towards him was shown to be exceptional. Now that Simon needs, what, now what Simon needs is correction. Something he is being given by Peter and turning to an appropriate path. Then Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. You know, we have to think that no two people are on the same level of maturity in their walk with Christ. We're all different. If one's level of maturity in Christ defines salvation, none of us would be saved. Where is the level? We're always supposed to be continuing to grow in our knowledge and wisdom of our Lord and Savior and God the Father. This is because everyone in Christ can and should increase in the knowledge of the Word. Simon is asking for help when he says, Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. I don't know what to do. I'm new to this game. Show me. Help me. Are we not called to do the same thing for new believers? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He is needing to be shown the way and how to pray. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. The mission in Samaria is coming to a close. You might call it a foreign mission. Right? At this point it was. It is now understood by the apostles that not only was the gospel to be preached to those in Samaria, but that these people who believed would also be given what they had, the Holy Spirit. As this is now known instead of unknown, the report of this could be taken back to the apostles in Jerusalem for their understanding. And hence, a greater mission field to the rest of the world. And that's exactly what has happened. The people of Israel are no longer the only focal point of God's attention. Boom. Something far greater. Something amazing is about to happen, and it did, and continues to this day.